What's up YouTube, I'm Guy. Today on the channel we're going to be talking about a pair of watches that are easily the two most important, significant, most certainly the two most popular watches on the market today. First of the dive watch genre, what we're talking about is the Rolex Submariner. Secondly, of the chronograph genre, obviously the Omega Speedmaster. It is really common for me to get this question. Something along the lines of, I want to get a new watch, or maybe I want to get my first luxury watch. Should I get the Rolex Submariner, or should I get the Omega Speedmaster? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think about that. I'm going to tell you what I think about both of these watches, and what it's like to have been owning them and wearing them for the last couple of years now. But before that, first a word from this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by TikTok Watch Repair, and a very big thank you to them for reaching out to me and offering to sponsor this video. TikTok Watch Repair is a friendly and professional watch repair center located in the heart of Los Angeles, California. Specializing in modern watches and chronographs, no repair is too big or too small for the certified TikTok Watch Repair technicians. If you'd like more information about the services they provide, visit the tiktokwatchrepairs.com website and download the service repair form, or select the Get an Estimate button. Once provided with an estimate and the work order approved, TikTok Watch Repair will complete the necessary work on your timepiece and ship the watch back, working like new. Don't forget to visit the TikTok Watch Repair Instagram for great detailed photos of their repair work, and check them out on Yelp, where they have all 5-star ratings and excellent feedback. It's become so common that I've gotten this question of, should I get a Submariner? Should I get a Speedmaster? Maybe should I get both of them? That I started to suspect that these are probably the two most popular watches in the luxury segment. Now, without a doubt, I understand why they are. I own both of them and I love them, but I wanted to confirm my suspicions. So, I threw up a couple of polls not too long ago on the Just Bluefish Watch Club Facebook group. First, I did a poll asking everybody in the group, what is your favorite luxury chronograph? And the Speedmaster went up against heavy hitters, the likes of which include the Rolex Daytona, the Breitling Navitimer, the Zenith El Primero, and the Speedmaster absolutely crushed the competition the majority of people voted for the Speedmaster being their favorite chronograph. The next poll I threw up was similar. What is your favorite luxury dive watch? And of course, the Rolex Submariner went up against a bunch of heavy hitters. What we're talking about, of course, is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, the Omega Seamaster, a bunch of other really great, very desirable luxury dive watches. And it was no joke, the Submariner crushed the competition in that poll as well. I think it's safe to say that these are, without a doubt, the two most popular luxury watches, certainly luxury tool or sports watches. I have no doubt. So the first thing we probably would ask ourselves is why are these watches so incredibly popular? I think there's a number of factors. There's the history of these watches, both very storied histories, a lot of provenance with these two timepieces. They've been around for ages. They've been refined and updated over the years, but they still capture the original DNA of the designs for which they are based. They are timeless classics. I absolutely understand why everybody loves these watches. I do as well. The Rolex Submariner began its life in 1953, technically, is when production began, and it went to market in 1954. It was beat to market by the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, so in the race to become the first dive watch as we know it today, yes, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms did get to the market first. However, I think that we could all agree that the Rolex Submariner eclipsed the Blancpain 50 Fathoms in terms of its overall reach in how often it has been used by professional divers. And for many, many decades, that's exactly what it was, a professional dive watch. It's been connected to a ton of really impressive names. Of course, there is the French diving 
company Comex. Uh, Jacques Cousteau, if I'm not mistaken, wore a Rolex Submariner. The British Royal Navy, even our own United States Navy SEALs at one time or another have used Rolex Submariners. Not the least of which, when we're talking about names that are connected to the Rolex Submariner, is of course James Bond. The watch was featured in the first four James Bond movies, if I'm not mistaken, and that really added to the, uh, to the mystique and appeal of this watch. Yeah, it has a long storied history dating all the way back to the 1950s. Now, while the Submariner came out in the 1950s, our Omega Speedmaster predates it by more than a decade. It was introduced in 1942, and its claim to fame is obviously its connection to NASA and the space program. Of course, first and foremost, Apollo 11 and the moon landing, the Speedmaster accompanied those astronauts to the moon. It's something that will forever be in the hearts and minds of enthusiasts when it comes to this watch. Apollo 13, number one, was a real event, and it's an event that the Speedmaster played an incredibly important role in, and of course we saw it reenacted in the Tom Hanks movie from 1995, if I'm not mistaken, of the same name, Apollo 13. And in that movie, of course, as the astronauts were trying to get back to Earth after a failure of their space uh, spaceship, for lack of a better word, uh, they used their Speedmaster for that all-important timed burn of the engines to get back on course. It's a watch that's been in our collective minds for decades and decades, and I think that the history and the connection to the NASA space program largely drives people to want to have a piece of that history and why I think a lot of people want to own this watch. Now I've said it before in the past, the idea of the historical provenance of a watch is actually not that important to me. I don't love the Submariner because James Bond wore it in some movies. I don't love the Speedmaster because of its connection with NASA and the space missions. Those are cool, and I don't begrudge anyone that likes these watches because of those connections. But for me, I love these watches because they're excellent timepieces. They are exquisitely crafted. They are of the highest quality that one could expect for a modern, rugged, durable tool watch. I love the designs. The designs are simple, they're classic. They're absolutely perfect, both of these watches, in terms of the overall aesthetic, the look and feel, and the design. Again, it's fantastic. Those are a lot of the reasons on why I love these watches. It has very little to do with that, uh, that history and the storied past of these watches. When looking at these watches side by side, it's difficult to address the question, which watch is better? They're both fantastic, and the idea of better or preference is largely subjective. Personal taste changes from person to person. So when I'm asked which I should get first, I usually kind of address it from my own perspective, and my perspective is going to differ from a lot of you guys. But I'll try to tell you the thought process that I went through when I was making that very same decision. Ultimately, though, the answer is get both of them if you can. Both of these watches have a touch of what I would call classic elegance, despite having a long history of being rooted in the genre of tool watch or sports watch. There's something about these watches that both dresses up and dresses down without really changing a thing. It's an interesting dynamic that you get with these watches that I find you do not get with the majority of watches on the market. Take uh, an average dive watch or an average dress watch. They don't really serve multiple roles. That's something that I find really appealing about these watches. They are certainly double duty in that regard. I think that uh, most people would say you can't wear either of these watches with a tuxedo. I might tend to agree, although truth be told, I'd probably do it anyway. I wouldn't say anyone's wrong for feeling that way though. Nevertheless, in just about every other environment, 
these watches would be, you know, absolutely fine from shorts and flip-flops up to business attire, suit and tie. I think you have no problem doing it all or pretty much everything with these watches. Let's take a look at the Speedmaster up close first. Simplicity is the name of the game when it comes to the overall presentation of the face of this watch. I think that the, the watch is dressed up quite a bit when it comes to uh, the overall design of the case and, of course, the bracelet. But with the face of the watch, with the dial of the watch, with the hands, very simple printing, crisp, stark, high contrast, white and black. Legibility is fantastic with this watch and it's one of my favorite things about it. Nothing I hate worse than a watch that's difficult to actually read. When I wanna know the time, I wanna know what the heck I'm looking at. Watches with really busy dials, with difficult to read indices, uh, low contrast colorations, that's not for me typically. This watch has legibility and simplicity in spades. Now, of course, it's a chronograph. A feature that I honestly don't find all that particularly useful. I just don't need to time things with a great deal of precision the way a chronograph is set up to work. But it is a cool feature. It's a complication that a lot of us will probably use more of, a, I don't know, a toy, for lack of a better word. Uh, something to just have fun with. Are we going to time our steaks on the grill with it? Yeah, probably, because we can. But are we going to time our, um, I don't know, quarter mile track times with it in conjunction with the tachymetric bezel? Absolutely not. 99.99% .99 of us are never taking this watch to the track and, uh, yeah, getting our, uh, you know, track times with it. It's just not happening. So chronographs are functional, they're useful, but it's not something that's necessary. The thing that's interesting about it, though, is that it's just pretty to look at. There's something enjoyable about looking down at your wrist and seeing those sub-dials, seeing that central seconds hand, seeing the, the, the overall layout and the balance and the harmony of all of these parts working in unison. That is just really appealing. And uh, yeah, I get it. I understand why this watch is so beloved. I think that has a lot to do with it. While the face of the watch is simple, legible, classic, it is just laid out perfectly. What's interesting is the, the case and the bracelet of this watch, that's where you get that hint of elegance. It's got those twisted lugs or the liar lug profiled case with alternating high polished and brushed surfaces. Sized just about right, in my opinion. Is it a little bit large for my six and three quarter inch wrist? Yes, it is, but it's certainly not too large. It's just a hair bigger than I might prefer. Now, if you have a much smaller wrist, you might have issues with the full-sized Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional, and you might try something like the Reduced or the First Omega in Space, a slightly smaller watch, but it's not too big for me. It is maybe just a hair bigger than I might prefer. I digress. The elegance of the case design and the bracelet with those high polished center link edges, that's what really kind of dresses this watch up and makes it feel that extra level of versatile that I had mentioned earlier. The original clasp on this watch, not outstanding. Of course, I've reviewed the Omega Speedmaster in the past as well as the Rolex Submariner extensively, and I talk about this in those videos. But let me touch on the fact one more time, the clasp on this watch as it comes from the factory is high quality and well made, but woefully inadequate. In terms of the adjustability, there's simply only two single micro adjustment points on the bracelet. I chose to buy a clasp made by Omega aftermarket and install it, which gave me a similar glide lock style system that we find on the Submariner. It gives you six levels of adjustability. I'm able to tune in the fit of the watch on the wrist now because of that upgrade. I highly recommend it.
keep that in mind. It is a shortcoming of this watch. The overall quality of the Speedmaster, the fit and finish, is outstanding considering the price point. But another downside is that price point. At over $5,000, it does not hold its value. And if you're the type of guy that wants a watch that holds its value, this might not be the first watch for you. If you're the type of guy that thinks in two, three, four, five years, I might wanna get out of this watch and sell it, you're gonna lose a lot of money if you buy it at that full retail price. You have to be extremely smart with your dollar when you're purchasing an Omega Speedmaster. Buying at gray market, buying it secondhand, or haggling like a mofo at the authorized dealer and getting a big discount. Otherwise, you are going to get the heck beat out of you when you go to resell it. Now we're gonna take a closer look at the Rolex Submariner. Again, a very versatile watch. It's funny, I find that the opposite is true with the Submariner vis-a-vis -vis what I said about the Omega Speedmaster. I said that the Speedmaster's dial was very simple and it was the case and the bracelet and the overall fit, finish, and quality of that presentation that really dresses it up. I think that the Rolex dial is what dresses this watch up and the overall fit and finish, the, the style and the aesthetic of the case and bracelet is relatively utilitarian, albeit extremely high quality. When you look down at the Rolex Submariner on the wrist, you know, I don't know what it is. It's something about the Mercedes handset in white gold with those large maxi applied markers on the dial, that triangular marker at the 12 o'clock position, something about that entire presentation just exudes a level of elegance that would seem to supersede the idea that this is simply a sports or tool watch. You throw the Cyclops magnifier on there, which is certainly a divisive feature about the watch, and for me, I just find that it really dresses up. That ceramic Cerachrome insert bezel is another feature that really makes the watch come alive and feel like more of a versatile watch than simply your standard tool watch. A regular dive watch might have a aluminum flat matte bezel insert and that makes the watch feel very sporty and very much like a tool watch. This watch has more glitz, more, more, more shine, it plays with the light better. All of those factors with the face of this watch are why I get that impression that it does give you that versatility of going from the beach all the way to the boardroom as the somewhat overused cliche goes. In terms of the overall fit finish and quality of construction, it's absolutely stunning. It's just very simple. Looking at the profile of the case, the crown guards, the lugs, everything is certainly bulky and it's another divisive feature about the modern ceramic Submariner. There's a lot of people that don't like the super case Submariner. I understand. I get it. If you're in that camp, you know, go for a pre-ceramic watch and uh, you'll probably be quite happy. For me, I love the super case Submariner. I think it's a fantastic design. It's absolutely the perfect watch for me. But it is, like I said, simple. There's no real hints of uh, embellishment like you have with that Speedmaster case, the twisted lugs versus this more squared and uh, straightforward slab-sided might be a way that it's sometimes described case. But I love it, I absolutely do. It's comfortable on the wrist, largely thanks to that Oyster bracelet with glide lock clasp. That's something that I do absolutely adore about this watch. I never want to take it off. I never feel like it is putting strain or discomfort on the wrist all day long. The clasp, of course, with that glide lock system is absolutely top notch, without a doubt, one of the best features of any watch that I've ever had. In comparing the bracelets of these two watches side by side, it's worth noting that the Speedmaster bracelet is much bulkier. The links are thicker. The 
the bracelet doesn't have taper anywhere near to the degree of taper that we find on the Submariner bracelet. That's a pro for some people, that's a con for some people. It depends on your perspective. When I first got the Submariner and um, my Rolex Explorer prior to that, I thought that the, 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 the Oyster bracelet had a little bit too much taper going down from uh, uh, 20 millimeters to I think 16 millimeters at the clasp. Yeah, that felt a little too extreme, but the more I wore it, the more I got used to it, the more I began to really enjoy it. I think that we often get, um, I don't know, not bent out of shape, but uh, preoccupied by things like that. I was preoccupied by the idea that it just looked too extreme. But in reality, after getting used to it, it was just right. People get preoccupied with a lot of different little minutia when it comes to watches. Uh, the Omega Seamaster and its helium escape valve is an excellent example where people would say, I'll never own that watch because I hate that helium escape valve. But in my experience with the Seamaster, you basically just get used to it and kind of forget about it after you know a couple of hours on the wrist, honestly. The same thing happened to me with this Oyster bracelet and that taper. There's another interesting thing, and again, we mentioned the super case of the Submariner being a divisive feature. Those large, squared-off, bulky lugs and the, the, the large crown guards on the watch. I find that that watch does not photograph well. If your main exposure to a Submariner, in particular this modern six-digit ceramic Submariner, is through pictures and videos, I think you're gonna have a negative impression of the watch. Originally, I did too. But when I started seeing it in person, and more importantly, seeing it on the wrist, it kind of changes, it morphs. You get used to it, and you eventually, at least I did, begin to love it. And yeah, the bottom line is that the watch just doesn't look great in photos. It looks much better on your wrist where it's supposed to be. Now both of these watches have timing features. Of course, the Speedmaster is a chronograph and the Submariner is a diver, so it has an elapsed time bezel. I find the elapsed time bezel to be superior in a lot of ways. So certainly not when it comes to uh, precision. If you really need to precisely track seconds or even fractions of a second, you're gonna need a chronograph. That's just, uh, you know, the way it works. I never really need to, to, to accurately track seconds or fractions of a seconds. The elapsed time bezel is just simple to use. You spin that sucker around and put it lined up with your minutes hand and, you know, as time elapses, you can see how many minutes have passed since setting the bezel. That's perfectly adequate for the sort of day-to-day -day tasks that I might need to track any passage of time. On the other hand, the precision that you get with the Speedmaster is superior in terms of the overall functionality. But I like the simplicity of an elapsed time bezel on a diver, and the elapsed, elapsed time bezel on the Submariner is superb. That's not to say that the chronograph functionality of the Speedmaster isn't excellent. The pushers, plunger or piston style pushers, they work great. There's something really satisfying about actuating the chronograph and starting it up, watching that central seconds hand begin to sweep, tracking your time. It's, it's a fun thing to do, but like I had described earlier, it's sort of a toy for me. Not for everybody, there's gonna be people out there that tell me that they need that level of precision. And for you, it's obviously the correct tool. But yeah, for me, it's more of just kind of a novelty. It's something fun to play around with. And yeah, it does give me the ability to track the passage of time if I need to. Now, both of these watches feature luminescence on the dial. That is to say, glow-in-the-dark functionality. Which is better? That's sort of difficult for me to pinpoint. They're different. On the Submariner, we have that blue chromolite luminescence. It's great, it's really attractive. It strikes me as being slightly less bright on the initial charge than the Superluminova that we find on the Speedmaster. That green on that dial stands out to me a little bit more. On camera, looking at the video, it doesn't appear that way. But trust me, in person, that's the impression that I get. Which is longer lasting than the other, 
I would say that they're pretty similar. They both last quite a while, but that initial bright blinding charge wears off pretty quickly. Then, uh, you know, unless you're in really pitch dark settings and your eyes are adjusted to the dark, you really can't see the loom on either watch. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just my eyes, but yeah, I need to be in very dark settings with all of my watches and my eyes need to be very well adjusted to that darkness for me to pick up the loom. So that's sort of uh, my impressions of, uh, of the loom on these two watches. A big factor, well, maybe not a big factor, but a factor for some people is going to be water resistance. The uh, Speedmaster's uh, 50 meters, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, whereas the Submariner is, of course, 300 meters. 50 meters of water resistance sounds like a lot, but in reality, the way water resistance ratings work, you would probably avoid getting a watch that only was 50 meters of water resistant wet, submerged specifically. You wouldn't really want to go swimming with, uh, with a Speedmaster. In particular, because of those exposed pushers on the case, water could get in there. It's a risk I personally wouldn't take. On the other hand, the Submariner can go in the water all day long, every day. I have no worries about water resistance with that watch. That's a factor for me, not because I spend a lot of time in the water, but just the overall durability. That is uh, something that is important to me, more so than things like the history of a watch. I wanna know that it can live up to the day in, day, day in, day out rigors that I might put this watch through. And the Submariner is just more equipped to handle just about any task you throw at it than the Speedmaster. My Speedmaster, of course, is the Hesalite Crystal version, and that's another factor. If you're considering Hesalite versus Sapphire Crystals, it's very easy to scratch. It's also quite simple to repair. If you get a light scratch in it, there's a product that you can use to buff the scratches out of that plastic or Hesalite Crystal. So it's nothing to worry about, but keep in mind, it's something that you do want to be a little bit careful with. Now, of course, there's a Sapphire Sandwich version of the Speedmaster, but I personally don't like the aesthetic of the sapphire version. It's difficult to describe, but the crystal has this sort of smoky or creamy ring going around the outer periphery of the crystal where it connects into the case. It just doesn't look as good as the Hesalite version, in my opinion. So that's another reason why I favor the Submariner. So which is better? Which should you get if you're considering a Submariner or a Speedmaster? From my perspective, I think the Rolex Submariner is the superior first choice. We've touched on it a little bit while we looked at the watches. It's a more rugged, more durable watch. It is as elegant and as casual as it needs to be. And so is the Speedmaster, but I feel like the Speedmaster might draw a little bit more attention than the Submariner. And it's funny, people always worry about uh, wearing a Rolex and everyone will notice it and everyone will know. Nobody really notices your watches, guys. That's just not really happening. I don't know, maybe if you live in like a really kind of upscale area, if you're in Manhattan a lot, maybe people are wristwatch watching. In my life, I've never had anyone point at my watch and go, is that a Submariner? Is that a Speedmaster? It just doesn't happen to me. And I think it largely doesn't happen to the majority of people. But... It's not that I'm saying someone will know you're wearing a Speedmaster, it's that the watch is just a bigger, bolder presentation, and I think that the, the, the Submariner is a little more under the radar. People are going to argue that point with me, but I think that the flashiness of the case and the crystal, uh, or not the crystal, the case and the bracelet makes that watch stand out more. That it's bigger, that the dial kind of presents larger than the Submariner's, and that's a, that's, a, that's a really big sticking point for me on these two watches, is the presentation of the dial is much larger on, on the Speedmaster, and it makes the watch look larger and bolder overall. Um, the, the Submariner's dial is smaller, it's more compact, it brings everything in. Now, the Speedmaster is a bigger watch by a few millimeters, 42 versus the 40 of the Submariner, but it does present bigger because of the openness of the dial, the smaller presentation of the bezel. It just makes the watch stand out more on the wrist. And while I don't think, again, anyone's going to say, oh, that's a Speedmaster you're wearing, I think people will just notice that you're wearing a watch more, not what watch you're wearing specifically. 
That said, back on topic, which one should you get? There's a ton of reasons why I think that the Submariner is the better first watch, at least from my perspective, the durability notwithstanding. There's also that retained value factor. Like I said, if you do go with the Speedmaster and decide you want to sell it, you are going to be out of a lot of money if you overpaid for that watch. And overpaying for that watch means paying full retail or anything close to it. On the other hand, you'll probably make money if you were able to to buy a Submariner at retail right now. That's a big factor in this decision. Can you even get a Rolex Submariner? Most of us can't. If you are unaware, if you walk into a Rolex authorized dealer today, July 2019, odds are they don't have any watches in stock for you to purchase. That's another problem. You just can't get these watches right now. It's been this way for the better part of a year, going on two years as a matter of fact. So, if you just can't get the watch, what are your options? Well, buying it on the secondary market, gray market, it's going to cost you a lot more. It might cost you, instead of $7,500 or $8,500, it might cost you ten dollars or $11,000. There could be premiums of over $2,500 on this watch on the secondary market because of the limited availability that we're seeing right now. That's a huge negative. And I would not advise anyone to pay over retail for any watch, in particular a relatively common watch like a Submariner. And despite the fact that they are hard to come by right now, they still are relatively common. Another big factor for me is just the overall comfort on the wrist. And I touched on it, but let me re-emphasize, I find the Submariner to be the more comfortable watch on the wrist. The Speedmaster is not uncomfortable on the wrist. But it's bigger, it's bulkier, it's heavier. Well, is it heavier? I've never really weighed them. I suspect it is heavier. It feels heavier on the wrist anyway. And with the stock clasp, it was all but unwearable. I had to spend an extra couple hundred dollars upgrading the clasp on the Speedmaster to become more comfortable on the wrist. But without a doubt, aside from maybe an ultra-light, simple Casio G-Shock, my Rolex Submariner is easily the most comfortable watch that I own. It's one of the big reasons why I almost never want to take it off. That's another huge factor as far as which watch I think I would get or which watch I would suggest that you get. Ultimately, they're both fantastic watches. You couldn't go wrong with either, and the truth of the matter is if you can get them both like I did, I think that's ultimately what will make you the happiest. But if you buy a Speedmaster, use your money wisely. Make sure that you're paying the right price. And if you're buying a Submariner, don't overpay on the gray market. But good luck trying to find one. It is, uh, yeah, it's a minefield out there. So, yeah, good luck. Uh, but my advice is if you can get one, I'd go with the Submariner and then eventually get the Speedmaster. Well, that's going to wrap this one up for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. First things first, big thanks to TikTok Watch Repairs for sponsoring this video. I greatly appreciate you guys reaching out to me and asking to sponsor one of my upcoming videos. That's really awesome. Uh, number two, if you like this video, if you like what I'm doing here, and if you want to help me out and support the channel, check the description of this or any video that I've ever published. There's a number of ways that you can help me. First and foremost, Go sign up and follow on my, uh, my social media accounts, be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whichever you prefer. You can also join me on my, um, my what's it called? Facebook page. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I have a group, the Just Bluefish Watch Club, and uh, we've got about 1,250 going on 1,300 members over there as of today, and would always enjoy having more members come over to the Just Bluefish Watch Club on Facebook and uh, chatting watches with us. If you'd like to help me out financially, uh, Patreon. I have a few people over there supporting me and helping me on Patreon. That support does really help me out. It, uh, it makes what I'm doing here possible. Doing giveaways, borrowing watches, shipping watches, all of those expenses, not the least of which is buying new equipment, which I've done recently here. I've invested a lot of money in new cameras, new software, new computers. All of that stuff adds up, and I definitely do appreciate the support that I've gotten from the guys on Patreon. If you'd also like to maybe support me financially, but you don't really want to do the Patreon thing, you can just shop on Amazon like you normally do. Use my Amazon affiliate link, click on that, and then uh, you know buy something I've reviewed, buy anything, it doesn't matter. I get a small commission. Those commissions do add up, and a big thanks to everyone that has been using my Amazon affiliate link. I greatly appreciate it. 
Well, until the next one, I'm going to wrap this one up and say bye now. Thanks again.